Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 74, Marriage and Domesticity. The number of powerful female Olympian deities, like Hera, Demeter, Athena, and Aphrodite, and the pivotal role of females in Greek myth, like Penelope, Helen, and Medea, not to mention the female prominence in the world of monsters, like the Gorgons, Sirens, and Sphinxes, and prowess on the battlefield, like the Amazons, contrast sharply with the restricted lives of most mortal Greek women that comes down to us through the sources. Naturally, much of the evidence for women in classical Greece comes from Athens, where the law drew sharp distinctions between women based on their social stratum, those being freeborn, medic, and slave. However, none of these women, whatever their station in life, had any political rights whatsoever, as Athenian society, like most ancient cultures, was dominated entirely by men. Still, though, one must be cautious about allowing the image of the female residents of Athens to represent Greek women in general. Athens was in many ways an unusual city. It was bigger, richer, and more powerful than most. It included in its population far more slaves and resident aliens than the average Greek polis, and its democratic constitution, while not unique, was probably more radical and innovative than those established elsewhere. All of these factors would have affected the lives, status, and images of their women. It is difficult then for us to know to what extent the experience of other Greek females diverged from that of their Athenian counterparts. Luckily, though, two other poles have left behind some evidence about the legal and social role accorded to women that indicates there were at least some differences elsewhere. Gorton, in their law code, which we discussed in episode 19, shows some variances, and the one dramatic exception was Sparta, which we discussed in episode 23. The bulk of the literary evidence about the lives of women in classical Athens comes in the form of tragedy, comedy, legal speeches, political laws, instructive treatises, and philosophical and moral writings. We probably have more archaeological evidence about women in the form of epigraphy, burial monuments, and painted images on pottery, but this evidence is equally as complicated at times. That's because all of these sources were created by, and mostly were written for, men, and there is no surviving ancient testimony by classical Athenian women on their own lives, at least in the traditional manner of written texts, as there is some evidence for magical papyri and cursed tablets that gives a very limited window on actual women's lives, since some were written by women, and others, though written by men, were never meant to be read by others, and so they aren't doing as much ideological work as literary texts. Still, we have a fairly detailed account on certain aspects about the conditions of daily life and the organization of Athenian society, which shows that women were excluded from most aspects of public life. They were not considered to be politai, a word which is normally translated as citizens, but more specifically refers to citizens with full political rights. Instead, the term asti was applied to women. Though this refers to their possession of civil rights, and thus is also often translated as citizen, it is a very different word from politai, because for Athenian women, citizenship meant only that they had a share in the religious, legal, and economic order of the Athenian state, but not the political sphere. This was because women could not vote, take part in the political assemblies, or hold public office, all of which were accessible to male citizens from all social classes. They could not be a witness in the law courts and were not recorded on deem lists. While men were referred to by their names in public speeches, women's names were suppressed and only mentioned in terms of their relation to a man. Furthermore, they could not write, produce, and perform in and for the theater. Women were also not permitted to go to school. This all was because the home and the family were their domain as marriage, conception, childbirth, and the raising of the children were their major concerns. Yet there were moments in a woman's life, particularly if they were well-born, when she was in a public spotlight through the conduit of religion. Marriage was the central event in a woman's life, as it transformed her social status, marked her identity, and allowed her to fulfill the main function and responsibility of a respectable Athenian woman— 
that being the production of male heirs for the household of her husband. This was further enhanced in 451 BC when Pericles introduced a law that limited citizenship to those who have two citizen parents, meaning that Athenian males could only continue their line with an Athenian woman. With this law, Pericles intended to prevent the elite from making marriage alliances with rich foreigners and thus creating powerful and lasting dynasties within the city. Quite hypocritically, this was exactly what his grandfather had done, as Megacles had married Agoristi, the daughter of Cleisthenes of Sicyon, about a century earlier. So it was very much a measure to prevent others from achieving the wealth and fame that his family had. The citizenship law, though, was not entirely retroactive, but the children who had yet reached the age of 18 were excluded from citizenship, and so the roles of the citizens' lists were stringently revised. It was a law that not only would have excluded his relative, the great Cleisthenes the lawgiver, but also Themistocles and Cimon, all three of whose mothers were foreigners. And so Athenian women were now the only ones who could bear Athenian children. Thus, this new law not only solidified the notion of Athenian identity as special and exclusive, but also empathetically recognized the privileged status of Athenian women in the crucially important process of establishing the citizenship of new generations of Athenians. The consequences of this legislation were both wide and deep. Throughout Greece, the discouragement of marriage between citizens and non-citizens increased the nationalistic tendencies of the polis. The insistence that people marry citizens of their own state eliminated a powerful source of connectedness among polis and fostered a sense of separateness that frequently led to war. Social problems were also created within the polis. Limiting their choice of marriage partners to Athenian women, married Athenian men frequently opened the door to domestic tensions by maintaining sexual relationships with the exotic foreign women whom they could not marry if they wanted civic rights for their sons and grandsons. A double irony awaited Pericles in his own family life, though, and his law that came to define his era would come back to haunt him, but that's a story for a future episode. Marriage was considered a matter of public interest in ancient Greece. This was particularly the case at Sparta, where the subordination of private interests and personal happiness to the good of the public was strongly encouraged by the laws of the city, supposedly set forth by Lycurgus, as we discussed in episode 22. He was said to have required that criminal proceedings were to be taken against those who marry too late, called graphi opsigamioi, or unsuitably, called grafe kako gamioi, as well as against those who did not marry at all, called grafe agamioi. These regulations were founded on the generally recognized principle that it was the duty of every citizen to raise up a strong and healthy progeny of legitimate children to the state. In fact, the Greeks considered technopoioie, or childbearing, as the main object of marriage. Solon also seems to have viewed marriage as a matter of social and political importance, as we are told that his laws allowed graphi agamioi, or a charge against those who do not marry at all, though the regulation seems to have grown obsolete in later times. In any case, there is no instance on record of its application. Plato appears to give a similar role to the state in regulating and applying political and social pressure to encourage marriage. According to his treatise The Laws, any man who did not marry before he was 35 was punishable not only with atemia, or the loss of civil rights, but also with a fine, and he expressly states that in choosing a wife, every man ought to consult the interests of the state, and not his own personal pleasure. Naturally, then, arranged marriages were common in Greek society, and the couple may have not even met prior to their wedding day. Still, though, matchmaking among the ancients remained outside the dominion of political and legal regulation, as this was entirely left to the care and forethought of parents, or women who made a profession of it, called promnestriae. According to Plato, though, the profession was thought of to have been very dishonorable, as it was connected with that of a paragos, or panderer. Literary evidence suggests that girls were married to much older men, some who were even old enough to be their fathers. There were usually no established age limits for marriage, although with the exception of political marriages, waiting until childbearing age was considered proper decorum, 
He heed in his works and days, recommends that a man should not be much less than in his 30th year, and a girl in her fifth year past puberty. Solon was of the opinion that the right time for a man to marry was between the ages of 27 and 34. Similarly, Plato claimed that a man was at his peak for marriage in his 30th year. Typically, it seems that girls married prior to turning 18, and that most brides would have been 14, 15, or 16 when they married. But there were some instances, particularly those who came from wealthy families, where the bride would be as young as 12 at marriage. The reasons for early female marriage probably lie in the fact that it was preferable to have a young woman who the husband could mold in order to run the household in the way that he wished. Furthermore, the disparity in the ages of husband and wife could have helped to foster the notion of the intellectual inferiority of the woman. We'll discuss both of those aspects in more detail shortly. A man chose his wife based on three things. The proix, or dowry, which was given by the father to the groom, her presumed fertility, and her domestic skills, such as weaving. The mature suitor would negotiate on his own behalf with his future bride's curios, which means master, but particularly in this instance, it means a legal male guardian. A father did not have to seek his daughter's agreement to the marriage, and the wishes of his wife did not always figure in the negotiations. This goes to show that in private aspects of life, women were always under the control of a curios, a father at first and a husband later or an appropriate male relative designated by the law, such as an uncle, brother, or even a son. This person was responsible for her protection, maintenance, and general welfare. In a sense, he acted as an intermediary between the private domain occupied by the woman and the public sphere from which she was excluded. To this end, he negotiated contracts and marriage arrangements on her behalf and represented her in court if she ever became involved in litigation. This can be illustrated particularly well by Xenophon in his Oikonomicus, through the mouth of his fictional character, Iskomachus, who is intended to be representative of many upper-class Athenians, when he informs his wife how he came to choose her as a bride. Quote, Have you ever wondered why it was I that married you, and why your parents gave you to me? It wasn't just because I wanted someone beside me in bed at night. You realize that, don't you? What happened was that your parents were looking for a suitable son-in-law, and I was looking for a suitable wife. I chose you, and they, from among a number of possibilities, chose me. End quote. Regrettably, though, Xenophon does not describe how she reacted on learning of her husband's passionless courtship of her parents. Regardless, although Iskomachus was able to exercise independence in the choice of his bride, younger men were oftentimes required to follow their father's wishes, too as marriages were also arranged through the meeting of the fathers of the young couple, who oftentimes based the marriage on their interests in expanding a business or forging an alliance between the families, with little concern about what their two wives thought of the situation. And of course, the wishes of the bride rarely factored as well. As in other societies of the time, the higher one was on the social ladder, it was more likely that their marriages were arranged, with economic and social considerations being the predominating reason. Wealth and status, rather than emotional attachment, were therefore the principal criteria for choosing a wife. Mercenary and cynical as this system may seem, we need to bear in mind that there were few opportunities for the creation of wealth in ancient Greece. A marriage alliance was therefore an opportunity both to produce offspring and to increase the family's finances. For the former, in the Athenian way of thinking, women were lent by one household to another for the purposes of bearing and raising a male heir to continue the existence of the oikos. For the latter, a girl would almost invariably have been provided with a dowry because without one, as Sophocles put it, she would risk ending her forlorn life unwed and barren. It is difficult to know whether many women remained unmarried. There are very few references in literature to individual spinsters, but this could be explained by the Athenian male's lack of interest in non-reproducing females. Spinsterhood was viewed by men as a disastrous fate. According to the orator Lysias, in his legal speech titled Against Eratosthenes, One of the consequences to the devastation of the Peloponnesian War was that women had been robbed of potential husbands, 
and in Aristophanes' Lysistrata, the heroine who is trying to put a stop to the war expresses the sorrow she feels for maidens who were growing old in the bridal chambers. An unmarried woman would have been financially dependent on her male next of kin, and as Demosthenes puts it in his legal speech titled Against Naira, those whose relatives were poor might have faced destitution or would have been driven into prostitution. Although there was other work available to women in Athens, it was scarce and it didn't pay much. While love as a motivation for marriage probably did not exist among the upper classes, those lower down the scale might have found it more feasible, and young people, theoretically, might have met up and had love affairs. The concept of love and marriage is largely absent in the literature of the classical period, but in the early Hellenistic period, the comic playwright Menander wrote many plays in which young men fell in love and were anxious to marry the objects of their affection. However, the fact that the plots of his plays focus on the removal of the seemingly insurmountable social obstacles standing in the way of wedded bliss suggests that love and marriage may not have been viewed as natural partners. Still, though, this did not necessarily prevent a loving relationship from developing in the course of the marriage. In that same section of Xenophon's Oikonomicus that we mentioned earlier, Iskomachus does admit that despite the fact that he didn't marry her for reasons of passion, a bond of mutual affection did develop between he and his wife. It's only natural that if you spend your entire life with someone, that one of two things could happen. You either grow in respect and admiration for your partner, or you grow in disgust and hatred. While the latter probably occurred frequently as well, there no doubt were husbands and wives who actually did come to love each other, and there were more tender and loving connections than the law and texts would suggest. Also, from the late 5th century BC onwards, there was a considerable increase in the popularity of family burial plots, and grave reliefs of this period commonly show the husband and wife together. Nevertheless, the expression of love for a wife remains a comparatively rare feature of Greek literature. Perhaps Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics expresses the most common male view of relations between husband and wife when he says that their affection given for each other is in accordance with merit, and the husband, as the superior, receives the greater share than he gives. Basically, he is saying that men deserve to be given more affection by women for what they contribute to them, and so this is why men don't shower women with affection. Essentially, Aristotle is describing and explaining the age-old stereotype that women are more emotional and affectionate, while men are calmer and more reserved. Of course, we all know this is false. There, of course, was other recourse for loving relationships, at least for men. Athenian men, though they could not officially marry a non-Athenian woman, could enter into a less formal and less binding agreement with a palaki, a term that approximates to a concubine or a common-law wife. Such unions could also be made with medics and prostitutes, like with Pericles and Aspasia, but most palaki were probably women whose families were unable to provide them with a dowry. Among the upper classes, the practice of keeping a palaki appears to have been relatively common. A palaki was placed under the authority of the man with whom she lived and was included in the list of women with whom it was illegal for another man to have sex. And so, legally, she was recognized much in the same way as a legitimate wife was, but with two very important differences. First, there was no transfer of dowry, and secondly, the offspring of such unions were not regarded as citizens and had no claim on a man's oikos. In a time of an emergency, though, such as during the Peloponnesian War, a law was passed that gave citizenship rights to the children of Palakai, but we will cover that in a future episode. Anyways, the man essentially became her curios. Generally, the Palaki lived separately from his home, but there may have been cases where they lived alongside a man's legitimate wife. There are a number of cases of this situation in Athenian tragedy, so it may very well be that cases like these would have taken place in real life. Oftentimes, an Athenian showed more affection for his palaki than for his legitimate wife, and this is where the love part might have come in. She was not restricted by the virtues of Eidos and Sophersine, and thus she could follow her partner to Symposia, where she could participate in male conversations and talk to other men. However, if Arcurios died or abandoned her, 
She oftentimes had little recourse but to become a prostitute, unless she had enough money to get a medic to marry her, or she was able to become a palaki for somebody else. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by Mack Weldon. Mack Weldon is a premium men's essentials brand that believes in smart design and premium fabrics. Their website is user-friendly, their shopping experience was quick and easy, and the underwear has been exceptional, and most importantly, it's the most comfortable underwear that I've ever worn. In fact, Mack Weldon will be the most comfortable underwear, socks, shirts, undershirts, hoodies and sweatpants, and more that you will ever wear. They want you to be comfortable, so if you don't like your first pair, you can keep it, and they will still refund you. No questions asked. Not only does Mack Weldon's underwear, socks, and shirts look good, they perform well too. They have a line of silver underwear and shirts that are naturally antimicrobial, meaning they eliminate odor, which is good for working out, going to work, going out on dates, and just doing everyday life. Mack Weldon is better than whatever you're wearing right now. So what are you waiting for? For 20% off your first order, visit MacWeldon.com and enter the promo code HOAG at checkout. Once again, that's MacWeldon.com with the promo code HOAG at checkout. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. A legitimate marriage was preceded by a formal betrothal agreement called angisis or angu, literally the giving of a pledge into the hand in which the dowry was officially negotiated between both parties, either by the two fathers or by the groom and the bride's father. Dowries varied greatly in size and generally consisted of money, valuable goods, and sometimes land was also included. Depending on the family, a dowry might have ranged from 10 to as much as 25% of the family's wealth. Daughters of even the poorest families apparently had dowries worth as much as 10 minai. Rich families obviously could provide much larger dowries. A large dowry, in addition to being an eloquent expression of a man's wealth and social status, was undoubtedly useful in attracting eligible suitors. For example, the aristocratic politician Alcibiades received the huge sum of 10 talents, or 600 minai, when he married the sister of Callias, one of the wealthiest men of his day. Only in exceptional circumstances would there have been no dowry since the lack of one could have been interpreted as proof that no legitimate marriage occurred. A dowry also may have been occasionally overlooked if a bride's family connections were very favorable. For example, the aforementioned Callias reportedly married Alpaniki, a daughter of Miltiades and half-sister to Chimon, in order to join that family and was sufficiently wealthy that he was not concerned with her lack of a dowry. She didn't have one, if you remember from episode 40, thanks to her father's huge fine for his involvement on Paros. Because the function of the dowry was to provide maintenance for the wife, legal restraints were imposed upon its use. Although the woman herself would not have been legally capable of using her dowry, and her husband could have made all of the arrangements for investing the money and for spending the major part of the income which it produced, most husbands would have been very cautious about touching the capital sum, because in the event of divorce, the husband was legally required to return it intact either to his wife's father or to an appropriate male relative. If he was unable to repay the entire sum at the time of the divorce, he was required to pay 18% interest on it until the original amount of the dowry was paid back in full. The wife's personal possessions, such as jewelry and clothing, were also to be returned to her family. This also occurred if the marriage was terminated by death, the couple had no surviving sons, and she chose to return to her father's oikos. The clear purpose of this law was to provide some protection for women and to ensure that divorcees and widows were not left financially destitute. It also protected the wife against frivolous divorces initiated by the husband, who just wanted to get her dowry, as well as a deterrent against ill treatment for a husband, because her family could terminate the marriage and take back the dowry. There will be more on divorce next episode. Anyways, the power which a woman with a substantial dowry might possess within the marriage is suggested by Plato's comment in his treatise titled Laws, that if there was a hypothetical abolition of dowries, quote, there would be less arrogance amongst women and less servility in abasement 
and lack of freedom amongst men on account of money, end quote. Athenian law also imposed strict regulations upon the marriage of a daughter whose father died, leaving behind no male heir, as Athenians were required by law to bequeath the bulk of their estates to their sons. Such a woman was known as an epikleros, or heiress, to the family property, which literally means one who is attached to a kleros, or a state. She technically was the one who inherited her family's property, but it did not actually belong to her in an ownership sense, but merely accompanied her when she married. She thus acted as a kind of conduit of the property, if you will, and so she was compelled by law to marry her nearest male relative on her father's side typically an uncle, in order to produce the desired male offspring and to keep the father's inheritance within the family. So strictly upheld was this epiclerate law that in many cases, existing marriages for both the heiress and the male relative were dissolved in order to comply with it. How much this actually happened, though, is unknown, but it was expected, legally speaking, for her to divorce her husband. Its purpose was to keep property within the family, and thus to prevent the amalgamation of several oikoi. This prevented rich men from getting richer by engineering deals with the guardians of wealthy heiresses to marry and therefore merge estates, and above all, it prevented property from piling up in the hands of unmarried women. As we discussed in episode 22, this differed from Sparta, where according to Aristotle, This type of agglomeration of wealth took place as women inherited land or received it in their dowries without, as Aristotle believed, adequate regulations promoting remarriage. He claimed that women in this way had come to own 40% of Spartan territory. The law at Athens was thus more successful at regulating women's control over property in the interests of promoting the formation of households headed by property-owning men. However, the next of kin who married an epikleros did not have unconditional control over the property to which he was attached. He only held it in trust until the son or sons that were born of their marriage came of age, at which point they became its rightful owners. As a disputant in a 4th century BC court case about an heiress, written by Isaias in his oration, says, Quote, we think that the closest kin should marry her and that the property should belong to the heiress until she has sons, who will take it over two years after coming of age. End quote. It was evidently thought to act as a necessary safeguard against a situation where the closest male kin might take the money, property, and so forth, and then fail to fulfill his marital duties. So much so that according to Plutarch, Solon stipulated that Epicleros' husband was to have sex with her at least three times a month, and that the Epicleros, if her husband was incapable of intercourse, meaning if he was an elderly man who couldn't get it up, had the right to marry his next of kin, typically his eldest son or her first cousin. Not surprisingly, relatives sometimes quarreled in the courts over who was entitled to the hand of an epicleros. At best, an epicleros, in terms of the control which he had over her own life, would have been in no worse a situation than any other Athenian girl whose marriage was arranged by her father. And for much of the same reasons mentioned before, marriages were often constructed between blood relatives, especially among the wealthy. Marriages between first cousins appear to have been particularly favored, though marriages between uncles and nieces, second cousins, cousins once removed, and siblings with the same father but different mother are also known. The exception, though, is of homo mitroi, literally of the same mother meaning that a brother and sister could not marry if they had the same mother, such as Kaimon did with Elpeniki. While technically not illegal, a connection of this sort appears to have been looked on with disgust. If the extended family did not yield a suitable candidate, then a woman might be offered to a close friend of her father. But marriages to men who were unconnected with the family also occurred. When the Kyrios announced that he was allowing his daughter to marry, the suitors would compete against each other for the daughter's hand in marriage. They would bring extravagant gifts or compete by song, dance, or games. When the suitor was chosen for the daughter, he and the father would enter into the Angaisis, or betrothal agreement, as we previously mentioned. They would swear an oath to Zeus Horgius that went something like this, quote, I hereby betroth my daughter, or niece, sister, and so forth, to you, whatever the man's name is, for the plowing of legitimate offspring, and I will settle a dowry on her of however much they agreed. 
end quote. This would be said in front of witnesses and would be a binding contract, although the girl was most likely not present. Furthermore, the term angaisis is related etymologically to gaius, which is literally a piece of wood in the plow. The use of this term to signify the betrothal leads to all sorts of social connotations. It essentially likens women to land, which is something that can be owned as a possession, is fertile, is passive, needs to be actively cultivated, is wild, and needs to be tamed in order to be civilized. Regardless, afterwards, the male and his future father-in-law became allies, called hetai, literally meaning clansmen, through the exchange of gifts in preparation for the transfer of the bride from one house to the next. These gifts, called dora, signified the alliance between the two households. The exchange also showed that the woman's family was not simply selling her or rejecting her, as the gifts formalized the legitimacy of the marriage. Gifts from the betrothed wife, called hedna, usually consisted of cattle. An Athenian law cited by Demosthenes in his law speech, titled Against Stephanos, indicates that the Angaisis defined the distinction between a legitimate wife and a concubine by granting only the wife the capacity to produce children who would become citizens. The emphasis is on legitimacy, citizenship, and the continuity of the civic community. Although a girl was legally married from the day of her betrothal, a day was named where her father would formally give her away in a wedding ceremony. This day would typically have been the first time that the young girl would have laid eyes on her future groom, as well as his parents. Marriages would usually take place at the time of the full moon, and the most popular month for marrying was that of Gamelion, or late January and early February, which literally means the time of wedding. This month was thus sacred to Hera, the queen of the gods and patroness of marriage. Much of our information about ancient Greek weddings derives from vase paintings, as none of the sources provides us with a complete description. Wedding rituals were enacted in both the oikos of the bride and that of the groom. The ancient Greek marriage celebration consisted of three parts, spanning three days. The paralia, or pre-wedding ceremony, was the time when the bride would spend her last days with her mother, female relatives, and friends preparing for her wedding. During this time, the bride would make various offerings, called procelia. To Hera, she consecrated a lock of her hair and prayed for conception, easy pregnancies, and healthy children. Her hair was cut short, possibly in order to ease the transition of male taste from homoerotic to heterosexual relations or possibly because a physical change in her appearance, was meant to signify a change in her life, from girlhood to womanhood. In this way, Hera was invoked as Talea, or the one who accomplishes. She also removed the girdle that she wore since puberty, and consecrated it to either Athena or Artemis, in addition to her childhood possessions to Artemis, in order to appease the goddess's anger at her impending loss of virginity. These offerings signified the bride's separation from childhood and initiation into adulthood. They also established a bond between the bride and the gods, who provided protection for her during this transition. On the day of the wedding, called the Gamos, a series of rituals surrounded the transfer of the bride from her father's home to that of her new husband. She woke up and first conducted a sacrifice, called Protelia, which was for the gods to bless her impending marriage. In particular, she made premarital sacrifices to Gaia, Oranos, the Aranes, or the Furies, the Mori, or the Fates, and to her ancestors. She then took a ritual bridal bath, and the women of the family went in procession to fetch the water to fill her bathtub, which was gathered and poured from a special vase known as a Lutrophoros, with Lutra meaning sacred water, and thus it literally means a carrier of sacred water. It had an elongated neck, flaring mouth, and two handles, and was often decorated with wedding scenes. Many of these were afterwards dedicated to the nymphs. For instance, at a shrine to a nymph on the southern slope of the Athenian Acropolis, many fragments of Lutrophoroi have been discovered with the word nymphae inscribed on them. If a girl died unmarried, one of these type of pots was often buried with her. Furthermore, very large Lutrophoroi were also used as grave stelae for the wealthy females who died unmarried, and one in particular can be seen in the ancient cemetery of the Karamikos 
Anyways, this ritual bath prepared the bride for her new life and thus symbolized purification as well as fertility. After this prenuptial bath in her old home, the bride was ceremonially adored with her bridal dress, a crown, and special sandals. A meat sacrifice was then made by the father of the bride, and it was followed by a feast held at the house of the bride's father and attended by both families. However, during the feast, men and women sat apart at different tables, as it was customary for the men to eat first, not only at the marriage feast, but in all other meals. The bride, who was veiled, also sat with the rest of the women, apart from all of the men, including the bridegroom. Beside her sat an older woman, called a Nymphutria, who guided her through the ceremony. Women were allowed to dine with the men after they had finished eating. Little cakes covered in sesame seeds were also served to the guests. These were believed to make women fertile. Towards the early evening took place the ectosis, literally meaning the giving out in which the father gave away his daughter to the bridegroom. He then led his bride, still veiled, from her father's house, either on foot, if the two oikoi weren't a far distance apart, or in a wagon drawn by mules or oxen. A chest containing her dowry probably accompanied her. The bride sat in the middle with the groom on one side, and the best man, or paranymphos, on the other. A torchlight procession preceded the wedding party along the route, and wedding hymns were sung in honor of Hymenius, the god of marriage, to the accompaniment of the aulus and lyre. Although the accounts vary, Hymenius was typically a son of one of the muses in Apollo. On the arrival at the bridegroom's house, the bride was led around the hearth of her new home, and the pair were showered with nuts and dried figs, called catechismata, Symbolic of the prosperity and fertility that it was hoped would attend the marriage. Boys with both parents still alive wore crowns with a wreath of thorns and acorns and offered the guests bread, which they served from a basket used for winnowing grain, another symbol of prosperity. Prayers were probably spoken or sung, but there was no state official or priest in attendance. In a play by Menander, the groom's father says to the bride, quote, I give you my daughter so that you can now sow her in order to produce legitimate children. End quote. The bridegroom replies, I accept her. However, we know of no standard form of words corresponding to an exchange of vows. Once the woman stepped in the house, the Sunokian, or living together, legalized the angysis that the suitor and the curios made. The pair then entered the bridal chamber, and the bride removed her veil, an act called opteria from the verb opteo, meaning to see, celebrating the fact that this was the first time, officially at least, that he had seen her without the veil. As this took place, there was an invocation of Aphrodite, which is depicted on the face of a small terracotta marriage altar dating to the 4th century BC and now housed in the National Museum of Taranto in southern Italy, where the seated bride is shown lifting her veil to face Eros and Aphrodite, both emissaries of sexual power. The bridegroom then presented his bride with gifts called anacolopteria, which signified the completion of her transfer to her new husband's family. The door to the bridal chamber was then closed, and a hymn was sung outside, called an epithalamion, from epi meaning around, and thalamos, meaning inner chamber or bedroom. According to later sources, the hymn's purpose was to cover the cries of the bride as she underwent the violence of being penetrated for the first time. On the following day, which was the palia, gifts were presented to the couple by the bride's father and other relatives. They were carried in procession to the house and included such items as wool baskets, pots, furniture, jewelry, fine garments, combs, and perfume, all alluding either to the domestic role or to the sexual identity of the new wife. These ceremonies all emphasized the fundamental nature of the transition in which the bride was involved. One obvious motif was that of alienation. By being veiled, the bride was converted into a non-person in her old home, so that she could be reborn as a married woman in the new one. There were also suggestions of a theme of abduction, At the start of the wedding procession, the bride was lifted into the chariot by the groom, and as she was led towards her new home, and again when she was around the hearth, the groom held her by the wrist, a gesture indicating control and possession. Several scholars have noted that many of the rituals performed at weddings, 
such as the purification and adornment of the bride, the cutting of the hair, and the procession accompanied by song, were paralleled by ones that took place both at funerals and at sacrifices. The equation between marriage and death is also something we talked a lot about with the story of the abduction of Persephone in episode 61. The idea of rebirth and renewal, which was a vital element in sacrifice, was present also in marriage. Symbolically, socially, and emotionally, this was the most important transition which she would ever undergo. She was passing from childhood into adulthood, from virginity into wifehood, and from the oikos in which she had grown up to the one in which she was to spend the rest of her life. And so marriage was a much more abrupt disruption in the life of a woman than it was for a man. Because the bride was removed from her family at an age when she was scarcely past playing with dolls in order to go live in her new husband's house with people she had never met before, including her husband, a lot of her initial experience must have involved grieving for her former life and fear of the unknown. It would not be at all surprising if the experience were a traumatic one, especially since it preceded the loss of her virginity to an older man who may have been a complete stranger to her. And so it's no wonder that a female character from a play of Sophocles, called Tereus, which only survives in fragments, says, quote, But now, outside my father's house, I am nothing. Yes, often I have looked on women's nature in this regard, that we are nothing. Young women, in my opinion, have the sweetest existence known to mortals in their father's homes, for their innocence always keeps children safe and happy. But when we reach puberty and can understand, we are thrust out and sold away from our ancestral gods and from our parents. Some go to strange men's homes, others to foreigners, some to joyless houses, some to hostile. And all this, once the first night has yoked us to our husband, we are forced to praise and to say that all is well. End quote. So we can see here the anxiety that may have pervaded most girls as they were thrust from one oikos to another and from childhood to adulthood. Furthermore, upon arrival to our new home, a woman would have had to take on a number of onerous duties, while men would spend most of their time outside of the family, either working, performing civic duties, or exercising at the gymnasium. Women lived very restricted lives, at least according to our literary sources, though some scholars have argued that the actual lives of most women, even in Athens, would have been much less restricted than the ideal seclusion suggested by literature and law speeches. Regardless, what can't be argued is that men also had the capacity to seek sexual gratification in several ways outside the house with prostitutes, slaves, or medics, as we discussed in episode 71. But respectable Athenian women were not afforded this same opportunity for sexual dalliance, and theoretically, an Athenian woman was confined for the whole of her life to relations with only her husband. This binary division of respectable and not respectable women and their roles is best illustrated in the legal speech of Demosthenes, titled Against Naira, when the speaker says, quote, Hetairai, or courtesans, we keep for pleasure, palakai, or mistresses, for attendance upon our person, but gunaikai, or wives, for the procreation of legitimate children and to be the faithful guardian of our households, end quote. Because the pure and legitimate lineage of the offspring was important, women were carefully segregated from men outside the family and were confined to the women's quarters in the house when an unrelated man visited. This ideology of separation was so strong that the speaker in Lysias' legal speech, titled Against Simon, sought to convey his opponent's licentiousness by telling how he had trespassed into the women's quarters, where his sister and nieces were sleeping, and he described them as women who have always lived so decently that they were ashamed to even be seen by relatives. This overriding concern, amounting almost to paranoia, on the part of Greek husbands concerning their wives' fidelity, can be seen in the character of Iscomachus and Xenophon's Oikonomicus, when he says to his wife, soon after they were married, quote, So it is seemly for a woman to remain at home and not be outdoors, but for a man to stay inside instead of devoting himself to outdoor pursuits is disgraceful, end quote. Lycurgus, in his legal speech, titled Against Leocrates, says that when citizen women show themselves in public locations, it is degrading both to them and to the Athenian state. The agora was especially deemed unsuitable for respectable females, and so it seems that it was common for the slaves to do the shopping. 
The segregation of male and female citizens was applied to social occasions that occurred within private homes. For example, even within her own home, a woman was not to have any contact with male visitors who were not relatives, and she definitely wasn't allowed to attend symposia, both within her own home and in the homes of others. I say this in his legal speech, titled On the Estate of Pyrrhus, says that if a woman went out to parties with a man, this was regarded as proof that she was a courtesan and not his lawful wife. And according to Theophrastus, in his treatise titled Characters, to even say that a woman talked to a man, even if she opened the front door herself, was tantamount to calling her a whore. Furthermore, we hear from Demosthenes in his legal speech, titled Against Avergus and Menesibolus, that it was appropriate for men, before entering someone else's home, to ask if the women were in their quarters so as to not run across them. An Athenian wife, though, would have had plenty of domestic tasks to do that would have consumed much of her time. So it could be that the domestic and time-consuming nature of women's work might have contributed greatly to the notion that a woman who was seen too much outdoors must be up to no good so that neglect of one's domestic duties became synonymous with a lack of modesty. Xenophon's character, Iscomachus, at another point, describes the role of Athenian wives. Quote, You must stay indoors and send out the slaves whose work is outside. Those who remain and do chores inside the house are under your charge. You are to inspect everything that enters it and distribute what is needed, taking care not to be extravagant. When the slave brings in wool, you must see that it is used for those who need cloaks. You must take care of the grain store and make sure that the grain is edible. One of your less pleasant tasks is to find out whenever one of the slaves becomes sick and see that they are properly looked after." End quote. As this passage indicates, it was the mistress of the household who was ultimately in charge of the domestic arrangements, and who was held accountable if anything went amiss. So it's clear why Iscomachus says there is no one that he entrusts more with his important affairs than his wife. Also, while Athenian women were barred from owning a property in a legal sense, ownership is a complex concept, and they do seem to have enjoyed this right when it comes to certain aspects within the oikos. For example, in regards to disposing of slaves and movable goods, such as furniture, clothing, and jewelry, as the overseers of the household, Athenian women can be regarded as property owners, though the Kyrios had the ultimate authority and could veto her in any decision that she made. Although Iscomachus may come off as a pompous and patronizing character, he does show some respect for his wife's managerial role within the home. When she modestly points out that none of her work would be of any use if Iscomachus were not such a diligent provider, he does reply that his labors too would be to no avail if he had nobody to guard what he had produced. So the separate natures and roles in their partnership play complementary parts in establishing and maintaining an orderly household. A similar testimony to the importance of the woman's role is contained in a fragment from the play Melanippe by Euripides. Quote, Women manage homes and preserve the goods which are brought from abroad. Houses where there is no wife are neither orderly nor prosperous. End quote. In a legal speech by Lysias, titled Against Diagiton, we hear about a family meeting where a mother, in a very competent and forceful manner, tackles her son's guardian, her own father, about his mismanagement of their estate, while at the same time demonstrating her sound knowledge of the family's finances. Although women were not allowed to engage in monetary transactions of any significance, more on that shortly, it would seem, though, that they were often responsible for managing the domestic finances. In Aristophanes' Lysistrata, the heroine supports her contention that women are quite capable of controlling the treasury of Athens by pointing out that they have been in charge of the housekeeping for years. And Plato, in his Laws, claims that the men hand over control of the money to their wives. According to Demosthenes' legal speech, titled Against Spudius, women might also be present at discussions about the terms of a family member's will and might even represent their husbands on these occasions. And Ascanes, in his speech, titled Against Tamarcus, refers to rich young men whose fathers were dead and whose mothers were administering their property. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by Parcast. What do the Holy Grail, Nefertiti's tomb, and Michael Rockefeller have in common? Well, they're gone. 
What do you mean they're gone? And what happened to them? Where did they go? Well, the search for these answers has me very excited about a new mystery podcast called Gone. If you're a fan of the History of Ancient Greece podcast, and I'm sure you are if you're listening, you probably love mysteries, and this podcast is full of them. The hosts of Gone examine historical disappearances and the theories these disappearances have spawned. If it disappeared, they're looking for it. The hosts dive deep into the past as they explore the stories behind everything that vanished throughout history. Each episode analyzes in-depth research to figure out what happened to these missing people, places, and items. You can check out episodes on The Amber Room, D.B. Cooper, and What Happened to Oliver Cromwell's Head right now. And with a new episode coming out every other Monday, you can expect episodes in the future on Hemingway's Lost Manuscripts, Blackbeard's Treasure, and many, many more. So right now, visit Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and search for Gone. Again, that's Gone, G-O-N-E. Or visit parcast.com slash gone to start listening now. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash gone to listen now. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. We've talked quite a bit about Xenophon's dialogue, Oikonomicus, and his character Iskomachus. So let's take a step back and talk about this treatise a bit. In the dialogue, Socrates describes a conversation he had with Iskomachus, in which he tried to learn from him how he managed to have such leisure for managing his estate. Iskomachus explains that he leaves the management up to his wife and describes to Socrates how he trained her. By using simple analogies and creating polarities, Iskomachus explained to his wife that the role assigned to women by society is natural, since it was ordained by the gods, and that it works to the advantage of both sexes. Although in his dialogue, Iskomachus claims that he has trained his wife to round the household effectively, it seems likely that he was deceived about the extent of his wife's innocence and malleability. In the course of her education, Iskomachus has not allowed his wife to assume any unusual authority. She runs the house, but remains accountable to him. It is important to remember that in training her, his purpose is to serve his own convenience, not hers. Iskomachus is not concerned with his wife's particular needs as a female, but rather wants her to behave as little like a conventional woman as possible. The philosopher Xenophon thought that females only possess the positive traits of vigilance and love for infants, and highlights their irrationality, religious fervor, and sexual passion. By nature, they lacked sophrazine, or moderation, and courage. Aristotle went further, stating that women were deformed, incomplete males, designed to be subservient to men. Looking at this cultural stereotype of women, it would seem that it was no accident that what little evidence we do have for actual Athenian women comes largely from courtroom speeches or medical treatises, both being literary genres that describe conflict and disease. The traditional view is that Athenian women were expected to remain at home, quiet and unnoticed. The ideal that respectable women should remain out of the public eye was so entrenched in classical Athens that simply naming a citizen woman could be a source of shame, unless she was a priestess. This was reiterated by Pericles during his famous funeral oration, found in Thucydides, when he told the widows and mothers of the Athenian men who died in the first year of the Peloponnesian War that the greatest honor a woman can have is to be least spoken of in men's company, whether in praise or criticism. Likewise, in Euripides' Heraclitae, the character of Macaria states that, for a woman, silence and self-control are best. And in his Trojan Women, Andromache declares, quote, There is one prime source of scandal for a woman, when she won't stay at home, end quote. However, to what extent this was true is impossible to determine, but it is unlikely to have been the case at all times with all social classes. For example, during the Peloponnesian War, when men were away for long stretches at a time, women must have surely enjoyed considerable more freedom than at other times. However, what is likely to have been true at all times is that she was not expected to have a social life with her husband. And when a respectable woman went outdoors, perhaps to visit women friends at their homes, she rarely did so unaccompanied, no doubt because the men perceived it to be unsafe. <laughs> 
Furthermore, women were identified by their relationships to men, and even in law court speeches, where a woman's position was often a key point in the legal matter, especially in inheritance cases, orders seemed to have deliberately avoided naming them. For example, although Demosthenes speaks about his mother and sister in five extent speeches relating to his inheritance, neither is ever named. In fact, in his body of extent work, he only ever names 27 women, compared with 509 men. The use of a woman's name, as in the case of Naira, has been interpreted as implying that she was either not considered a respectable woman, or that she was deceased, and thus she was able to be talked about. The playwright Euripides represents two very different reactions to this cultural norm. First, his female protagonist, Alcestis, represents the perfect wife, sacrificing her own life so that her husband, Admetus, can live. In contrast, Medea breaks the marital conventions twice by choosing her husband herself when she ran away with Jason without her father's permission, and by reacting against his later infidelity by killing her own children. Towards the end of his play, Euripides' heroine, Medea, describes the fate of women in terms that appear to give an accurate account of the condition of women in 5th century BC Athens. She says, quote, Of all things which are living and can form a judgment, we women are the most unfortunate creatures. Firstly, with an excess of wealth, it is required for us to buy a husband and take for our bodies a master. For not to take one is even worse. And now the question is serious, whether we take a good or a bad one, for there is no easy escape for a woman, nor can she say no to her marriage. She arrives among new modes of behavior and manners, and she needs prophetic power unless she has learned at home how best to manage him who shares the bed with her. If we work out all this well and carefully, and the husband lives with us and likely bears his yoke, this life is enviable. If not, I'd rather die." A man, when he's tired of the company in his home, goes out of the house and puts an end to his boredom, and turns to a friend or a companion of his own age. But we are forced to keep our eyes on one alone. What they say of us is that we have a peaceful time living in home, while they do the fighting in war. How wrong they are. I would very much rather stand three times in the front of battle than to bear one child. End quote. It's ironic, though, that the one woman who complains of women's lot is a powerful central figure in a tragedy that is named after her. In fact, in a society that valued women's silence, their predominance in the most public of Athenian art forms constitutes a paradox, as only one of the surviving 32 plays has no female characters, that being Sophocles' Philoctetes. The ancient Greek sources about women thus don't fit well with the image that we get of them from the pictorial art on vase painting and from the tragedies and comedies that were performed every year at the two great dramatic festivals in Athens, the city Dionysia and the Linnea. These portrayals, though, derive very much from the mythology, which after all is the religious tradition of the Athenians. These sources often show women as central characters and powerful figures in both the public and the private spheres. Clytemnestra, who shows up in Aeschylus' tragedy Agamemnon, arranges the murder of her own royal husband and establishes the tyranny of her lover, whom she dominates. Then there's the terrifying and powerful Medea of Euripides, who negotiates with kings and can commit horrible deeds in her fury. Medea is a foreign woman who has unusual powers like a witch or a sorceress, and is a cause of terror to the audience, but at the same time an object of their pity and sympathy as a victim of injustice. Another of the great tragedies of Attic drama is Sophocles' is Antigone, who is another heroic woman who defies kings and everybody else in order to do the right thing, and who accepts death rather than to give way in her principles. These are not the kind of women that Pericles had in mind during his funeral oration. Since these tragedies were produced at state expense, staged before most of the Athenian population, and were written by Athens's greatest poets and dramatists, the role of Athenian women may be more complex than their legal status might suggest. Naturally, the position of women in classical Athens has been the subject of much controversy, as some scholars have begun to question this overly schematized view of Greek society, regarding it as based on a highly selective set of sources that present an idealized view of how Greek society should operate from an aristocratic male perspective, and so it may very well be somewhat at variance with everyday reality. <laughs> 
In particular, they cite scenes of daily life on vases, which show women enjoying far more freedom in the company of other women than literary sources suggest, such as scenes of women fetching water from wells. And the female chorus in Aristophanes' Lysistrata speaks of the crowd that gathered around the fountain every morning. Other examples that challenge the more conventional view of repressed and uneducated women include images of women reading, playing musical instruments, and dancing, but we cannot know how typical such scenes are of daily life. Also, the ideology of seclusion for the ideal Athenian woman, not going out in public or interacting with men that she was not related to, would only have been practical in wealthy families, where slaves would have enabled free women to remain in the house. Even in antiquity, it was not recognized that an ideology of separation could not be practiced by many Athenians. For many women of the lower classes, confinement to the home would not have been feasible. For example, Aristotle in his politics asked the rhetorical question, quote, How is it possible to prevent the wives of the poor from going outdoors? End quote. Naturally, the wives and daughters of the poor, as well as many spinsters and widows, would have frequently been seen in the streets, because in most households, the responsibilities of daily life would have forced them to leave the house frequently, as they were needed to carry out tasks such as going to the market, washing clothes, fetching water from the well, and so forth. No doubt, then, in the course of these chores, it was possible for interactions with unrelated men. Furthermore, some lower-class women also had to work outside the home, so no doubt they came into contact with men, either through their jobs or while getting to them. And of course, women who lived in rural deems of Attica, and thus who would have been responsible for such outdoor tasks as tending the gardens, feeding the chickens, and so forth, probably had a much different experience than city dwellers. Still, though, even the most respectable citizen women in Athens emerged from their homes on religious and ritual occasions, particularly in the various festivals of the state religion, where they would have interacted with men and participated freely. In this way, the role of some women in public life was neither invisible nor negligible. They not only took part in processions at these festivals, but they held important functions in many of them, such as the Panathenaea, where men and women were apparently not even segregated during the procession, and they led animals together to be sacrificed at the altar of Athena and the Acropolis, the festival's most religiously significant part. There are many vase paintings attesting to their role in these sacrificial processions. They also were permitted to attend the theater during the city Dionysia and the Linnea, though they may have sat separately from the men. Not only could they attend almost every religious festival in Attica, they also could attend the Thesmophoria, a festival honoring Demeter, the goddess of the fertility of the earth, which was restricted in most places only to married women. And so it was an opportunity for women to socialize amongst one another, open and freely. The most important role played by women in the public sphere was in religion as priestesses. Some priesthoods ran in families, handed down from one generation to another. After the installation of democracy in Athens, though, many were chosen by lot in the same way that political offices were appointed. Some were young, and they surrendered their priesthoods when they were married, since priestesses were required to abstain from sex, and others remained priestesses for life. Usually priesthoods of female deities were held by women and those of male deities by men, with a few exceptions, though, such as the Pythia, the priestess of Apollo at Delphi. About 40 of Athens' priesthoods were in the hands of upper-class women, and in particular, the priestess of Athena Polius at Athens was a position of such great importance that she took pride of place in the center of the eastern frieze on the Parthenon. And the weaving of Athena's sacred robe was carried out by a team of young girls, called the Ergastini, or workers. They were also the ones who removed and ritually washed the goddess's robes annually. Musical performances were also a part of the religious life of girls. For example, during the Panathenaic Festival, a chorus of young women kept up an all-night vigil on the Acropolis and danced and sang in honor of Athena. In the private sphere, women could attend births and marriages, and they played a major role in funerals and mourning rituals. Women in particular played the major role in preparing the body for burial, as they still do in most Mediterranean countries to this day. We will discuss their role in funerary contexts more in a future episode. Also, there is no reason to believe that Athenian women, particularly those in the lower classes, would not have had their own circle of friends and neighbors of their own sex, 
as part of an autonomous sphere of female relationships that existed in parallel with the masculine social network. For example, women went to help each other when they were in labor, and according to Theophrastus, in his treatise titled Characters, women might pop into a neighbor's house to borrow some salt, a handful of barley, a bunch of herbs, and so forth. Female friendships, though, unlike their male equivalents, were formed and conducted within the home. Even so, it cannot be denied that Greek society did practice a certain degree of segregation of the sexes even if women were not entirely secluded from their male counterparts. And it was certainly the case that they had no political or legal persona, as they were barred from political participation and not permitted to represent themselves in court. Still, although Athenian women were formally disbarred from the political arena, some Athenian women do seem to have involved themselves in public affairs. For example, Plutarch in his Life of Pericles tells two stories about Elpeniki's public actions. Once she criticized Pericles for making war against other Greek cities, and on another occasion, she pleaded with him not to prosecute her brother Chimon on charges of treason. Regardless, women still couldn't buy or sell land, and they were also forbidden from conducting any economic transactions worth more than a nominal amount. A law quoted by the 4th century BC order, Isaeus, decreed that no child or woman should have the power to make any contract above the value of one medimnos of barley. It has been estimated that a medimnos was a measure of grain sufficient to sustain a family and food for perhaps five days, maybe a week at the most. So that's the kind of buying, selling, and lending that women supposedly were restricted to. This amount would have been large enough to account for the petty trading activities, such as selling vegetables, which we know some Athenian women engaged in, but it would certainly have ruled out any major transactions, such as buying and selling property. Humorously, in Aristophanes' Thesmophorizuzai, the women who have just taken over the government at Athens introduce a law which reverses this situation by imposing the same economic restriction on men instead. However, as is the case with many aspects of women's lives, although the law and ideology may specify one thing, it seems that this restriction was not always obeyed, especially in poorer families where women would have had to work in order to earn money just to get by, in addition to also being responsible for performing the household tasks, such as cooking, washing clothes, and so forth. As we discussed in episode 68, Home-based manufacturing and craft work was also common for the lower classes, and it's very reasonable to think that the wife would have helped her husband in his endeavors. In addition, men were often absent, not just in Athens either, especially during times of war, and so the women had to do whatever they had to in order to keep the households operating, regardless of what law and ideology restricted them from doing. No doubt they would have had to buy and sell produce in the agora during these times, Xenophon in his memorabilia records a conversation with Socrates and a man named Aristarchus, who once complained that as a result of the political turmoil produced by an oligarchic coup in Athens, an assortment of homeless female relatives, presumably whose husbands had been murdered, had moved into his house, and as a result, he had to support a total of 14 people. Socrates suggested that these relatives be put to work making clothes, though Aristarchus was at first reluctant because that aristocratic prejudice against work. He finally set them up with a woolworking business, and as a result, they not only succeeded in providing for their own maintenance, but made profit for Aristarchus. Opportunities for paid work within one's own home like this must have been abnormal, though, and no doubt were only due to the tumultuous times. Furthermore, the order of Demosthenes in his legal speech titled against Eubioides tells us that one of the effects of the poverty that afflicted Athens after its defeat in the Peloponnesian War was that many women had to go into the public to work. He mentions this with great shame, adding, quote, We do not live in the same way we would like, end quote. In Aristophanes, Thesmophora Zuzai, a widow with five children, describes how she earns a precarious living by weaving garlands of the kind that might have been worn by symposiasts. Besides prostitution, women who sought employment typically engaged in occupations which were an extension of domestic skills that they had acquired during their years, such as wet nurses, midwives, weavers, and washerwomen. There are some unusual and less popular occupations, though, that we have evidence of women engaging in, unrelated to household tasks, including cobblers, gilders, potters, groomers, and grape pickers. The most elevated recorded female profession belongs to a woman of the mid-4th century BC named Phanostrate, whose tombstone states that she was both a midwife and a doctor. <laughs> 
There is no evidence to suggest that women doctors were at all common in Athens, but there is perhaps a grain of truth in the story, told by the later Latin writer, Hyginus, in his Fabulae, about an Athenian woman named Hagnodike, who was forced to disguise herself as a man in order to practice obstetrics, and later demonstrated her true sex by raising her tunic in court when she was accused of seducing her patients. We will talk about women and their role in the medical field in ancient Greece more on a future episode. Anyways, it is impossible to assess what proportion of Athenian women took on paid work or how easy it was for them to find it either. Regardless, it is clear that although in the 4th century BC, there was still a stigma attached to the working woman. And the economic troubles which Athens experienced as a consequence of the Peloponnesian War and her subsequent loss of empire would have undoubtedly produced an increase in the number of women who sought out employment for survival, and some of them, like Aristarchus's relatives, were relatively well-born. Regardless of the uncertainty surrounding the lives of women in ancient Greece, certain unpalatable facts are not in dispute, though. For instance, a girl's chances of survival was poorer and her life expectancy was shorter than that of a boy. Her opportunities for acquiring an education were virtually non-existent. The law regarded her as a minor, whatever her age, and should she choose to abandon her traditional role as a mother and housekeeper, virtually only one profession not relating to motherhood or the household was available to her, that of prostitution. Partly as a result of the imbalance in life expectancy, the reverse, of course, of what prevails today, men tended to marry women who were a decade or more younger than they were, And this had huge implications for relations between the sexes, because it meant that husbands tended to have more life experience and thus could lord it over their wives. At the same time, though, the evidence, meager as it is, does suggest that men did not always have such an iron-fisted upper hand. Comedies, law court speeches, and anecdotes here and there provide us with a valuable insight into the lives of Athenian women that differs quite differently from the bulk of aristocratic philosophical literature, which generally views the home as an extension of the masculine sphere of authority. To give a humorous example, according to Diogenes Laertes, Socrates' wife Santhippe is said to have doused him in water on one occasion and to have stripped him of his cloak in public on another. Even so, we should not attach too much credence either to a remark ascribed by Plutarch in his life of Themistocles to the Athenian politician who claimed that his son was the most powerful person in Greece on the grounds that the Athenians commanded the Greeks, he, Themistocles, commanded the Athenians, his wife commanded him, and his son commanded his wife. However, while some women might have managed to exert some influence on the public decision-making of their husbands, that probably was an abnormality, and the situation is probably best encapsulated in Aristophanes' Lysistrata, when the heroine comments forcefully on her total lack of influence over her husband in political matters. Quote, And if I so much as said, Darling, why are you carrying on with this silly policy? He would glare at me and say, Back to your weaving, woman, or you'll have a headache for a month. End quote. Relationships between the sexes were no doubt complex, though, as they have been throughout history. In Euripides' Trojan Women, as Hector's wife Andromache observed, quote, I offered my husband a silent tongue and gentle looks. I knew when to have my way and when to let him have his, end quote, which surely is the recipe for a happy marriage in any age. If we can take Aristophanes seriously, and that's a big if. On the basis of Lysistrata, we can surmise that withholding sex may have been a very persuasive female ploy for gaining control over her spouse. Aristophanes himself even acknowledged that while he didn't like it, for obvious reasons, methods such as this could be very effective. It was in the interest of the Athenian state that the individual oikos should be maintained as a viable economic unit, both because this ensured a continuing supply of soldiers and sailors, and because the economic self-sufficiency of the oikos was an important factor in keeping at bay the civil strife which increasingly racked so many other Greek states in the classical period. It was against this background of overall political stability that Athenian democracy was maintained and strengthened in the 5th century BC, and so there was a merging of women's private and public roles. As contributors to the survival of the individual oikos, they were central not just to the well-being of their families, but also to the vitality of the democratic state. This idea is expressed quite simply by the female chorus in Aristophanes' Lysistrata when it states, quote, I have a share in public service for I contribute men, end quote. And that contribution will be the topic for next episode. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, episode 75, 
pregnancy, contraception, and abortion.